Hi, today's mini lecture is going to be about the assignment for strings and loops. And let me close this, which I don't need. Let me erase the message window. And let's go here and look at part one. So in part one, we're going to be asking the user to repeatedly enter a sentence until they press only enter. And we're gonna tell how many vowels, consonants, digits, and other characters, namely anything that's not a letter or digit, are in the sentence. So the question is, how would we do something like that? So let's do something that's a little bit similar. And what I'm going to do here, actually, I'm going to get rid of this trim here because that is not what I want at the moment. So given a string, I want to find out how many of the characters are right angle letters. And these are the letters that can be written in uppercase with only right angles. And those are the letters E, F, E, F, H, I, L, and T. And we've gotten the, I, I put in this loop here already because we've done it a, uh, several times and I didn't want to spend time retyping it. Let's just test that to make sure that that works. And so I print in. Okay, cool, that's all working. And I'm gonna put in a system to out dot print line for readability of output. And notice, by the way, these comments are telling me why I'm doing things, not what I'm doing. I'm printing a blank line. Why am I doing it? I want the output to be more readable. These comments are what, because when I'm describing the purpose of the program, that tells what the program does. This is not gonna be a why or how. Okay. Well, we know how to go through all the letters of a string one at a time. In fact, why don't I would, uh, do this for the moment? Let's keep this in output here. And what we're going to do is we're going to have integer, and that's going to be, let's call it n right angle. That's going to be the number of right angle characters. And it starts off at zero for every sentence. Then we're going to say for integer, index is zero index less than line dot length, index plus plus. We're going to use a for loop to go through it one at a time. And then we're going to say our character, ch, is going to become um, line dot char at index. And let's just see that this works properly, by the way. I just want to make sure that th th this part is working before I go any further. So I say A, B, C, D, E. Okay, cool. I'm happy with that. Now what we're going to do, we're going to have to ask, okay, is the character one of these when we uh, convert to uppercase? That means that the first thing we'd like to do is we're going to have to say, and I don't know if I can do this with a character. This is going to be interesting. Let's see if this works. I may have to change things around a little bit. You know, when I want to try things out rather than do it in my program, I think I'm going to use JShell. So if I say CH is lowercase a, all right, char CH, duh. Can I say CH becomes... Um, character dot two uppercase of ch is there such a thing yes there is okay cool there happens to be a two uppercase for characters i am a happy person now so i'm going to translate it to uppercase that way i don't have to do testing for both upper and lower case so i'm going to use the two uppercase method that's in the character class, and that will translate it to uppercase. Okay. Avoid having to deal with both upper and lower case. Again, that's why I am doing this. Now, I could do this the hard way. 
I can say, okay, if the character is equal to E or the character is equal to F or the character is equal to H or you can't. The character is equal to I or the character is equal to L. Boy, this is a... <laughs> I'm glad I had chosen a small set of subset of letters here. Then the number of right angle letters plus plus. Otherwise, if it's not one of those, I don't want to do anything at all. Now, once I get out of this loop, I can say system.out.println you had percent D right angle letters. Oh, no, it's not a print LN, I'm sorry. This is a print F, that'll work much better. And let's say I also want to find out, um, also, so the user, how many? characters were not um, right angle letters. Now, does that mean I have to do here something like otherwise? Oh my God, well, the jury's asked to disregard that. I was going to do something really weird and it's not gonna work, okay? It's, it's, it's going to work, but it's not what I wanna do here. So the question is, how many other letters are there? The easiest way to find that, that out is to say the number of others, or let's call it n non-right angle, is going to be line dot length minus the number that had a right angle. The subtraction will give me the answer that I want. And then I can say percent d characters were not right angle letters. And that'll be in non-right angle. There we go. So let's go and compile this. And let's try a word like the. I should have two letters that are upper, that are right angle letters and one that isn't. Well, that certainly didn't work very well, did it? Oh, that's right. T-H and E are all upper. <laughs> Hello, let's try a different one. How about that? The T, the H, and the T are going to be right angle letters, and A is not. There we go. Three right angles and one characters were not right angle letters. Perfect. Okay. And let's try something like um, helper. Four right angle letters, the H, E, L, and E, and the two, the P, and the R. And if I have something like um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, so it's going to be counting these spaces. Now the question is, do I wanna count only letters? If I wanna count only letters, then I have to change my logic. But let's leave this for the way this is for the moment. Here's the problem. Well, no, no, let's put this in here. This, this is a good idea. Okay, now I'm getting where I want. This is perfect. So we're going to have to say the number of non-right angle, and we're going to count letters, not characters, but letters only. So that means if we get a comma or a space bar or a question mark, we don't count that because it's not a letter. Yeah. Now, do I want to say, first of all, else if CH is equal to A, or ch equal b you can see that this is going to go on for a long time we need a better way to do it one way that we can do it and this is sort of sneaky if the character is greater than or equal to a and the character no i don't even need to. let's 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 do something better remember i want to be able to do things with accent marks 
So if character dot is a letter, then the number of non-right angle plus plus. Then I don't need to do this length minus business. Some of this, by the way, may be relevant to what you're doing when you're doing the assignment. Some of it might not be. I'm just exploring this particular program at this moment. Let's think about it. Let's say it's the letter B. Is it an E, an F, an H, an I, L, or T? No, but it is a letter, and therefore it's not a right angle letter. What if we have the letter F? CH is equal to E? No. Character equal F? Yes, F is equal to F, and that means this whole thing is true. Remember, we can early exit. That means we'll do this. We'll add one to the number of right angles, and we won't do the test to see if it's a letter and add it to non-right angle because the if came true, we ignore the else. This should do what we want. And... I just need to say which 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 character is the letter. There we go. So let's try that and four exclamation points. We should end up with three right angle letters and one non-right angle letter. And all those exclamation points should just be ignored. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. So this comma that, I should have one, two, three, four, five, six letters that are right angle and two of them that aren't, the S and the A. Perfect, that's exactly what I wanted. Now, this is still bothering me because if I had a whole bunch of things and specifically, I'm looking at you consonants because there's a lot of consonants in the alphabet. If I did it with an if statement like this, this would turn out to be really, really ugly. Let's go to J shell and do a quick experiment here. Let's say I have here a string called right angles and I give it E, F, um, H, I, L, and T. Now let's have a character CH and have it be, let's say, a capital M. I can say right angles. Let's find the character inside of right angles. Comes back as negative one. That means that M is not one of the right angle letters. What if I say index of capital T? That comes back as five. Right angles dot index of E comes back as zero. And right angles dot index of, let's say, A would also come back as negative one. So that's how I can tell if this is one of my right angle letters. I can create this string and use index of instead of having to use this whole long compound condition. This whole long compound condition is not wrong. There's nothing wrong with it. It works exactly as advertised. I just want a better way to do it. So let's save this as right angle letters two. And we'll call this. And what we're now going to do here is we're going to have final string. And let's call it right angular is going to be E, F, H, I, L, and T. Now I can say if right angular index of whatever character I'm looking for is greater than or equal to zero, that means it must have been inside this string. And that will give me my N right angle. Otherwise, check to see if it's a letter. And if it's a letter, then it's a non-right angle letter. And if I do something like this, comma, that, it works exactly the same. 
The word the has three right angle letters. So this is a semi largish hint on an approach that you might want to take when you are uh, looking at the first part of the strings and loops assignment. Now let's talk about the second part, which is something called the standard deviation. And I just added this, by the way, today, what an explanation of a standard deviation is. We're going to repeatedly ask the user to enter a price of an item or negative one when they're finished. That's going to be our sentinel value. And if you read the book, you know what sentinel value is. It's a special value that we use to detect when the loop should end as opposed to continuing. Then we're going to compute and display the total number of items, the average pri price, and the standard deviation of the prices. So you're saying, well, what's the standard deviation business? So you may want to read this. I'm going to go over it fairly quickly here. So let's look at these first set of numbers, 10, 20, 50, 80, 90. One way to describe a set of numbers is by its average. So for example, if I have two sets of people and one of them, their average height is 120 centimeters and the other one, the average height is 130 centimeters. I know that on the average, the second group probably has taller people than the first group. Here though, I have two sets of numbers and they both have the exact same average. But if we look at them on the number line, they're distributed really differently. This first set you can see is spread out a whole bunch more than this second group. If these were test scores, let's say, I would say um, these people are a lot less, I say, they have a lot more variety in their test scores than these people. These people are all pretty much right around the center, whereas these people are really spread out. So in addition to the mean, the average, we would like to have some measure of spread outiness. Well, one way to figure out how spread out they are is to say, okay, let's say these are mile markers on a road. So I've got a mile marker at 10, 20, 50, 80, and 90. How far would I have to drive from 10 to 50 plus 20 to 50 plus 80 to 50 plus 90 to 50 in order to figure out how spread? The more I have to drive, the more spread out the numbers are. Here, I don't have to drive as far. From here to this average point is a lot less than from this one here to the average point. So by adding up the distances from my points to the average, that gives me some measure of how spread out they are. So for the first set, it's 40 plus 30 plus 20, plus 40 plus 30 plus 30 plus 40, and that adds up to 140. And for the second set, it only adds up to 52. So the larger this sum of the distances is, the more spread out we are. And here's how we express it in mathematical terms. We use, this means sum, S-U-M, not S-O-M-E. So this is the addition of the absolute values of each of the items in our X set of numbers minus the average of X. So this X bar is how we pronounce it. So in fact, in math, I would pronounce it sum of the absolute value of X sub I minus X bar. That's how I'd say it. And this is a perfectly reasonable measure of how spread out the values are. There's only one problem and that's that we're using the absolute value function. And mathematically, that is not a nice function to have to deal with. Uh, if you've taken calculus, you know that trying to do differentiation with absolute value is problematic. So let's, we need these distances all to be positive. If we use negative and positive, it'll always add up to zero. And so that's totally useless to us. So how can we get all the distances to the center to be positive? Well, if we square them, they're guaranteed to be positive. Negative numbers squared turn out to be positive. So for that first set of numbers, it works out to 5,000. And for the second set, it works out to 776. Again, the first set of numbers is more spread out than the second set. And mathematically, that's the sum of x sub i minus x bar quantity squared. 
Okay, so far so good. Here's a little sort of problem though. Let's look at these three numbers. These are just as spread out as this second set here. You can see from 32 to 68 are the endpoints. And here they are also 32 and 68, but the sum of squares won't be as big because there aren't as many numbers. Because here I had five numbers and I was adding up their squared distances. Whereas here I'm only adding up three numbers squared distances. So I'll take that into account by dividing by the number of items minus one to make that. And that's the only, the only reason I'm dividing by N minus one is because statistically that makes things work out better. I'm not going to go into long detailed explanations. Trust me on this one. And this, by the way, this formula is called the variance. Now, the other problem is when we squared the numbers, like 68 squared is pretty darn, or 68 minus 50, that's 18 squared, which is a pretty big number. In fact, if you look at this sum of squares, we got these ginormous numbers, 5,776, as opposed to 140 and 52. Well, one thing that we can do is we can use a square root of the variance, and that'll cancel out the squaring, so to speak. And this is the formula for the standard deviation. You take each item and subtract the average, square that, add them all up, divide by n minus one, and then take the square root of it. And that's the classic standard deviation formula with one small problem, and that's that I need to go through all the numbers twice. I need to go through all the numbers first time to get the average. Then I have to go through them all again to compute x each individual X minus the average. So I have to go through all my numbers twice. Well, if I had only five numbers, no big deal. If I have 5,000 numbers, uh, that turns into a lot of work. So it turns out there's some nice algebraic magic that you can do with this equation. And it translates to this formula, which is the one I want you to use. It's the one in the assignment. And with this one, I need to process each number only once. So let's look at this. This says I want n times the sum of each item squared minus the sum of all of the items and square that. In fact, I should probably bring this up here. Let's see if I can find this. Uh, oh no, it, it, it's, it's here in my browser. If I can find the browser again. Yeah. Excuse me, let me move it. This is side here. So this will be the sum of the squares and the sum of all of the items squared. Now, this is all very abstract. So why don't we do this calculation, a calculation by hand to calculate the standard deviation? So let's have our numbers that we're going to be using. We're going to have 12, 7, 3, and 20. So my first item is 12. And then we're going to have a negative 1, which is going to end our loop. We're not going to count it in. So item is 12. Well, first of all, before we start, by the way, what's our sum of sum? Zero. What's our sum of squares? Also zero. Uh, let me do something here real quick. Excuse me, I've got to find this here. So sum of squares is zero, and the number of items we have so far is zero. Okay, there. Now I'm now I'm much happier. So my first item is twelve. That means I add 0 plus 12, which now changes that to 12. I take 12 squared, which is 144, and 0 plus 144 is now 144, and I now have one item. My next item is going to be a 7. 7 plus 12 gives me 19. 
Seven times seven is 49. Um, I just might have to do this on a piece of paper here. 144 plus 49 is 193. And now I have two items. My next item is going to be a three. Three plus 19 is 22. 193 plus nine is 202. And N is three. And my last item is going to be 20. 20 plus 22 is 42. 20 uh, squared is 400 plus 202 is 602. And I now have four items. I get the negative one and I'm done with my loop. Now I'm going to plug it into this formula here. I'm going to do this and I'm going to have, um, yeah, let me just write it down here. It's going to be four times the sum of the squares of the prices, which is 602 minus 42 squared. And I'm going to divide that all by four times four minus one. So let's see what that comes out to. Four times 602 is 2408. In fact, let's put it in. Now let's, let's should, should I have, yeah, let's, let's, let's have Excel do, do the arithmetic or the spreadsheet do the arithmetic, arithmetic for me. Four times 602 minus 42 times 42 divided by four times four minus one. And now I've got to give an, get enough parentheses here so that everything is in the right order. And that comes out to 53. And then we want to do the square root of whatever's in cell A13. So this should be our standard deviation, should be 7.325, if I did my arithmetic right. Now there's a way to check this. Let's put in those numbers again, which were 12, 7, 3, and 20. And here, let's have a, the spreadsheet ask for the standard deviation of A7 through D7. Yep, and there it is. So again, here's what I did. Every time I got an item, I added it onto the sum. I squared the item and added onto the sum of squares, and I added one to n. You know what? This is worth writing down in my notes. And of course, I forgot to save a file for this, as usual. Curse me. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Where are we here? Um, so every time I get a number from the user, well, first thing I got to do is set things up. So I have to set my sum to zero. I have to set the sum of squares to zero. And then I have to set the number of items to zero. So every time I get a number, if it's not a negative one, then I'm going to add one to the number of items. I'm going to add the item to the sum and I'm going to add item times item to the sum of squares. As long as I don't have a negative one. Now I have N, the sum, and sum of squares, and I pop them into the formula in the assignment. 
there's my standard deviation. Now there's one slight problem that we need to worry about and that's what if n is equal to one? If n is equal to one, we can't get the standard deviation because we'd be dividing by zero. So we have to put some code in there to make sure that we don't print things out when we don't want them. So if the total number of items is zero, we print a message saying something like no data, no results. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise we have at least one item. If we have only one item, then we can, well, we can always strike an average. And if there's zero items, we're out of luck. We can't get an average of, of no items, but we always can get the average. Now, if there is more than one item, we can calculate the standard deviation. Because n minus one won't be zero. Otherwise, we have only one item, which means we need to tell the user we can't get a, a standard deviation. What I've done here is I've written something called pseudocode. Um, oh, This part here is going to have to be in the correct places in here. Okay. Again. Uh, but there's in the so I can't just remember after I get done with this loop, I can't just say, oh, okay, now I'm going to calculate the standard deviation because I might not be able to. If they gave me zero items or one items, I can't do it. I gotta make sure it's okay for me to do it this way. Again, this is what is called pseudocode. That's half English, half Java. And it's a good way to write a plan. Now, notice that the plan is not engraved in stone. I said, oh, okay, well, let's just, you know, pop it into the formula and tra-la-la, there we are. And then I said, oh, wait a minute, I might not always be able to do it. So I had to change my plan. I had to add to my plan. And I might have to move this to a different place in the plan. So your first plan is not engraved in stone. And is more engraved in jello. <laughs> but again, at least I'm going into this program with a plan rather than just say, okay, let me just write code and throw it against the wall and see what sticks. That's a really bad approach and it really tends to waste a lot of your time. So that I think is what you will need to know or these are these are some rather generous hints for the part one, which will use a lot of the stuff that we did in the right angle letters. Not the exact same logic, but it should give you some idea on how to plan it out. 
Um, and the second part where we did a calculation by hand just to see that we understood the process. And that's usually a very important thing to do. And then we wrote down, okay, here's what we did. And we wrote in half English, half Java, so that we can get an idea of, okay, here's what we're going to have to do to make this happen. And that is today's mini lecture. See y'all next week. And what I'm going to do probably on Monday, I know there's a midterm coming up. I think it's coming up on October 4th. I'm not sure. Let me just check this out real quick. Do, 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 do. Boxes. Yes, midterm ones on October 4th. So it consists of a part where you're going to be doing questions and answers. And there's a second part of it also on the same day where you will be expected to write a program. And together those add up to 75 points. So I'm going to talk about that on Monday. That, that's going to be the topic for Monday's mini lecture. See you then. And um, have a good weekend.